It's Tuesday, July 9th, 2013. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights tonight. Hanabi. He gonna blow up. Let's do this. This might be your last episode of Geek Nights for a little while. Guaranteed. Probably won't hear from us until August. At least not in podcast form. Though it is likely you'll hear from us in other forms. Wait for the meta moment. Yes. But uh, suffice it to say, if you're looking for a bunch of Geek Nights for the next few weeks, I'd recommend You've got, the I don't archives. know, like fucking eight years worth. Jesus oh my Christ. God. We've, got, <laughs> we've got so many episodes out. It's ridiculous. All right. Yeah. So yeah, Kineticon is this weekend. Why are you going to the meta moment so quickly? It's the opening. I'm preparing my <laughs> final stuff. I'm printing out things. I'm making DVDs of backup panels like we had DVDs, last year in case anyone uh, fails. There's uh, DVD players in every room. There are, So sadly. I got this library of videos of our old panels <laughs> that we can just play if someone bails and we don't have a replacement We're not going to use every mecha opener ever in chronological order up through the 90s? Uh, you want to bring it? You bring it. I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I would like on this Tuesday to review a game that Scott and I both played. So a geek bite doesn't deserve a full show. But uh, we bought 3DSs, and we actually played the Adventure Time game. Hey, Ice King, why'd you steal our garbage? All right, people told me, hey, there's an Adventure Time game for 3DS. And I was like, wait a minute, those games are usually just licensed shovelware. And they said, no, 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 this is actually like a Zelda 2 clone is good. It is a Zelda 2 clone if you remove all the effort of Zelda 2, and if you make it easier than Minish Cap. It is basically non-challenge the game is garbage <laughs> ice king why'd you steal this game yeah, i'm going to list in order the good things about this game good thing number one the music is great there's not a lot of it though but what there is is great the music that is in this game is great good thing number two there is one joke that is hilarious and i'm going to spoil it for you right now there's this point where the ice king gives the uh, finn and jake this really lame puzzle and Jake's like, man, it's like he's not even trying. And then Finn just looks sad and says, no, man, I think he's actually trying really hard all the time. <laughs> that is the funniest thing that happens in this game. Uh, I think that, you know, in the early part of the game, it's sort of jam-packed with characters and stuff right up until about Candy Kingdom. Yeah, and then the right? game gets real Roger Rabbit sparse. Right. It's like suddenly, though, after you... And each character pretty much says one thing, and then you move on, and there's no reason to, like, talk to them again ever. And so... they don't even do anything. Like, I met, you know, I found tree trunks, and I was like, oh, maybe I can get something. I get her to make the pie, and I'm like, okay. And then I find that Chris Lapple, and I'm like, oh, man, I should take that to her. Doesn't fucking do anything. No, there's nothing There's nothing like that to Choose do. Goose wants all those wads of cash. I get him. He just gives me a useless bomb and then asks for more cash for another bomb. I don't even know why you need the bomb. What is it good for? Nothing. It just does a tiny amount of damage if you throw it at someone. Yeah. And there's just all these things that don't do anything, and the game is so sparse that there's nothing to do. The puzzles are literally walk back to the beginning and then walk all the way back to where yeah. you are now See, again. this is the one place it deviated from Zelda 2. Zelda 2, just like, say, Metroid, Super Metroid, or other Zelda games, has a few items that are all really useful and essential. Every item is awesome. In this game, it's like, here's a whole bunch of random, completely different healing items you have to store in this inventory and I didn't even bother figuring out. I put syrup on everything and just ate it and whatever. Yeah, it's what, it doesn't fucking matter. The only time I used an item ever is when my thing was full and I'd use an item to get another item. And it all doesn't these tell items, you what most of the items do. And all the items that seem like they should do something really cool just give you a little buff. They don't like to actually turn you into a demon or anything cool. No, they... There were so many opportunities that were wasted. But what really bothers me is the lack of effort. Mm. Because there's one great bit in the beginning where you save Hot Dog Princess's little dude. Pretty much, this is the last point where the game is cool. And she's like, hey, Jake, you know, one thing I've always wanted to do is have you stretch yourself out really long so I could just walk all over you and feel you, like, squishing under my feet. And Jake's like, that's really fucked up. <laughs> that's really creepy. But now I can't stop imagining myself doing that. And then he gets the ability to turn into a bridge because he can't stop imagining that. He's conceived of the idea of turning himself into a bridge. And now he can go across all those uh, bridges that you saw all over the place. Yep. Later in the game, 
uh, no, you just find, open a chest, and it's like, Jake now knows how to do the whatever. It's like, really? You couldn't even put that token effort into keeping your funny theme through to the end. And the game is ridiculously short. It does that stupid thing a lot of games do where it's like, okay, let's extend the gameplay by adding a plus mode. And it's like, what? Why would I ever play? Plus mode still plus. has the tutorial at the beginning. Seriously. Yeah. And the final end, when you talk to the snow golem, who I guess can talk now, great. Like, just normally talk, and you have to go collect all the clouds to make his cloud bride. Forcing you to backtrack all over the map instead of making a new area. But also then you backtrack, super lazy. You don't backtrack to, like, four boss fights or four hard dungeons. You backtrack to literally places where you jump up in a place where you cannot die and there are no consequences of failing. <laughs> there's, just, there, there's no consequence of failing anywhere in this game and it's it's everything is completely linear. Well, you do have to go back to a save point if you die, but there's a save point every two at, pixels. At least the save points have hot water nymphs. That's all I can say about I them. I know, but they never interact with you again except when they're dancing up with Party God. Like, they... There's all this pretense of flavor and pretense of the things you like about Adventure Time... But literally, the game could be about any other property, and you wouldn't even Yeah, notice. it's like, if you're going to give me a game and say, look, we know this isn't the best game in the world, right? But we have inundated this game with this licensed property that we know you love, and that is why you're going to enjoy this, just for the licensed property and not for the game part. You better fucking drown me in fucking Adventure Time and shit. And the game did for the first 20 minutes, and then it just all stopped. Yep, it's sort of like... You like can you imagine the people characters who talk to you halfway through yeah, the game. You can imagine people develop this game and it's like you know okay they start working on it like they're working on level they're working they on obviously it in played order who framed roger rabbit right and Zelda it, no, it's like they're making level one and they're like okay we got to put adventure time stuff all over and they get to working on level two at the candy room, and they're putting all sorts of stuff in there and then it's like oh we got to get this thing out hurry up and get those last levels out shit i would guess that 80 plus percent of the areas and things in this game do nothing and are not interactive all you do is walk Hit boring, same old enemies that can't really hurt you. I never leveled up hearts until I couldn't level up anything else because I never got damaged. Then the enemies, one, in a game this short, you're going to pull a pallet swap on me. Yeah, right. <laughs> and two. And it's a, it's, it's a DS game and a 3DS game, but you know what? Both of those systems have zillion, tons and tons of storage on those little cartridges. You can fill it up with shit. And the enemies, while there's a bunch of them with really good animation... Basically killing them's all the same. There is literally nothing to combat. Hit the button. Hit it again. Oh, look, an ability. It'll be immediately useful right here and probably never again. I guess it's a game a kindergartner could play if the, you know, there's a target audience of young kids with DSs who want to play Adventure Time. But, but the, here's the thing. I was their age playing Zelda 2, so fuck that say. bullshit. When I was a young kid, Zelda 2 was my jam. If you'd given me this when I was at the age when Zelda 2 came out, I would have thought it was garbage. Exactly. <laughs> and I still think it's garbage. I would have thought it was for like nursery school kids who couldn't even talk. So at least one positive about the game, I guess, is that its price reflects its quality. It is cheaper than other games, though not cheap enough. I'm going to sell my copy to get some money's back. This game is worth maybe a dollar or two as an iPhone game. Yeah, something like that. So shame on anyone who recommended we play this game. This game is bullshit. They're coming out with another one. I'm not going to even bother. Nope. Because it, it wasn't even, there was one or two good jokes, and they're all in the beginning, and then there's nothing else. I guess it was kind of funny that Lumpy Space Princess tries to literally kill everyone in the world at the end, but that side-scroller shooter at the end was awful. Yeah, so the next one is called Adventure Time Explore the Dungeon Because I Don't Know 3DS. It could be like a, dun no way. No, a no. dungeon crawl. No, nope, I learned my lesson. Uh, my whole life, I have said, licensed property games are shit and I will never play them. You assholes tricked us into playing this game. I was right. I shouldn't have played it. But this Explore the Dungeon Because I Don't Know isn't just going to be a portable game. It's going to be on PS3, 360, 3DS, and Wii U. So maybe it is. And play solo or grab your friends for four-player co-op multiplayer. I am highly Voice overs dubious. from original TV cast. Is it developed and published by the same people? I don't know. Because if it's made by the people who made this game, I have zero faith in it. It says, all new story and adventure from series creator Penn Ward and developer Way Forward. So is the developer of the old one Way Forward? And then conquer a massive hundred floor dungeon. So it could be a roguelike. 
Yeah, not trusting it, not playing it. Yeah, just saying. This game was awful. <laughs> so, in my news, today may be a day where something happens that I never thought would happen, but wanted to happen. Uh-oh. The return of Civ Five. You know, I've been worried about this day. I'm so. Because for those of you who are unawares, <laughs> Civ Five had some good parts, but some bad parts. Well, mostly the multiplayer. I think we got to go all the way back because when Civ 1 and Civ 2 came out, that was an era where you would either, you know, put the save file on a disc or something and share it with someone mm -hmm. or... You just played single player, and you had infinite time and didn't care. It was great. Mm -hmm. I think I might have spent more hours on Civ mm -hmm. 2 than any other game ever, mm -hmm. including the you know decade plus of Counter-Strike I've been playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Civ 3 was pretty good, but mostly neglected by people. Civ 4 was the one that really caught on hardcore. But it's easy to forget that Civ 4 was super fun, but we didn't really play it for serious or multiplayer until a bunch of expansions came out mm -hmm. because they made the game as crunchy and beautiful and horrifying as <laughs> Civ 2. So Civ 5 came and streamlined a lot of stuff in an Eclipse Euro game sort of fashion, right? Which, good and bad. Yeah. On one hand, it made combat really clever and advanced warsy. On the other hand, it turned into a board game and I found myself always playing to win and never playing to do my bullshit like I used to do in Civ 4. Yep. So Civ 5 had problems with the multiplayer, which we've discussed in this podcast. Mostly, it wasn't turn-based, and there would be a lot of completely arbitrary shit, and there was play-by-mail that didn't... I don't think there was play-by-mail. And... Multiplayers didn't work at all, and single-player was actually really simplistic and not that fun. Yeah, so Civ 5 today has released an expansion... It's not their first expansion, but it is a new expansion called Brave New World. And they call it, let's see, ahem, the culmination of the game's evolution since its 2010 release. This game's three years old. At least it's getting an expansion now, so don't look for Civ 6 anytime soon. This supposedly fixes the multiplayer. They recognize the problem. How often is it that we point out a problem and someone does what we say they should do? Holy shit. This supposedly on paper fixes. Well, I Civ remember 5. when we were talking about Civ 5 originally, we kind of expected because Civ 4 was not actually that great until they added all the expansions to it later. It's almost like Civ has version one, it's like the beta and then the real version. So, yeah, uh, hopefully this is on the Steam sale because when I get back from Australia in August, I guess everyone will be way better at this game than me because I guess they've also been playing it since Might 2010. Might just buy it now and play it on my laptop on the way to and from Australia. Who knows? Who knows? But that's 20, that's 50 hours I can spend playing this game minus takeoff and landing twice each way. Uh, I think I'll be doing a variety of things with my hours and not just one thing. What, like what? What are you going to do on the plane? I can do lots of stuff. I can read some books. Nah, sit five play some 3ds games i have a stack of my what i think what i'll find interesting though is that if we start playing multiplayer if i recall my experiences with civ 5 before the expansion because the combat is basically advanced wars i never really lost battles <laughs> so i wonder my if main that will problem, remain true my main problem with civ 5 is that this just even though it is simplified from say civ 4 uh, there's still just way too much stuff. It's just like you open up a city and it's like, yeah, check out all this shit. You got really? freaking. You know, when, I, when I look at Civ 5 before the expansion, I'd open up a city and be like, so where's all my bullshit? There's like nothing here. Click, click, click. My city's perfect. There's nothing I can do there's to make like, it better. Oh, just managing one city is an entire game in and of itself. No, nah, partly because unlike Civ 4, the game really didn't encourage you to build just one of everything. So you had to be a little more choosy and there's not as many decisions to make in the pre-expansion Civ 5. Mm. But anyway, there's just in Civ, there is a lot of stuff going on everywhere. So I like to play it, to, you know, turn-based asynchronously. So every single turn, I can check every single thing. If you play Ideally, real time, my ideal. If way you to play, play real game, time, then what happens is people are like, "Hey, hurry it up, asshole!" And I'm like, "Hey, I'm checking my city." I think the I ideal way, as I've always said, to play a multiplayer game of Civ Five is to play the first, you know, X hundred turns live with yeah, voice chat. Those don't have a lot of as many, uh, you know, hard decisions when and you only have. And then get to like a, a sort of a plateau point, and then go play by email asynchronous and then occasionally like once a month or so schedule a let's play with voice chat for a while 
Hopefully, the multiplayer in this new version will allow that sort of uh, arrangement. Yeah, we will give it a, the full and brutal review once we start playing it. But PAX in Australia August. takes precedence. Yeah. But anyway, things of the day. So there's a comedian, uh, Simon Amstel. Uh, I've seen a couple of his bits just because a lot of it's on YouTube. But there's a video here that's actually pretty great. They take one of his short stand-up routines, cut out all the laughter, and replace it with kind of sad piano music. And it really, coupled with, you know, when a comedian tells a joke, like, you don't pay attention to what they're doing when they're waiting for the laughter to die down before they start talking again. But just the way his delivery is, it almost looks like he's about to cry. And the words he's saying are actually really sad and pathetic, if not in the context of stand-up comedy. So it's actually kind of sad and poignant to watch Basically, this. it's like when they took The Shining and made it into a different movie trailer. Shining. This guy took his own comedy routine and turned it into a different thing. It's pretty By great. Editing shows it's pretty the great. power of editing. We all know. Yes. Yep. I, now, I hope you know. If you're if an you audio don't guy, know, you're in trouble. If you're an audio guy, you can tell kind of how they cut the laughter out, and you can hear some artifacts from that in there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you want to hear a thing of the day? I uh, perhaps do. How about a newsreel uploaded to YouTube that, that's like 10 minutes long of the 1933 Stanley Cup final, Rangers at Leafs. In Toronto, the Rangers won, by the way. (laughs) Uh, They didn't win again. I think they won a few other times, but then they had like a 54-year gap of not winning. (laughs) Um, But yeah, this is pretty amazing. Uh, You can Think about that. A 54-year gap means that... You're watching this old-time hockey, and even though, like, you know, there's no lines on the ice, really, except for the blue lines, and no one's wearing a helmet, not even the goalie, not even a face mask, it looks a lot like the hockey that's played today. A lot of the basics of hockey have not changed that much over the years. Yeah. And uh, they go in and they interview both teams and all the coaches. And it's like, whoa, this is, you know, this is pretty incredible right here. And then it's at the end when they show the picture of the, St- the 1933 Stanley Cup. It's like, oh, man, <laughs> look at that Stanley Cup. Oh, my God. The Stanley Cup to this day, to me, is pretty much the most prestigious sport thing you can get. I put it higher than a gold medal in the Olympics. Well, yeah, because think about how many Olympic gold medals there are. A ton, right? How many, you know, think about you win a baseball World Series, they make a new trophy for you. You win NFL, soccer, World Cup. But hockey? They make new World Cups every World Cup. In hockey, there is... The Stanley Cup. Lord it's not, Stanley's Cup. Right. You don't, it's not like they make a new Stanley Cup for everyone who wins every time. It's like, no, no, no. There is one, and that's it. And that's why I think other sports really made a big mistake not well, doing you the get, same you thing. Get the, there's a, a special, particular kind of excitement you only get with hockey, and that is the excitement of this is a game where the cup could appear. It is on the premises because if one of the, these two teams the wins... cup is on the premises. Well, not there, a, well, the... There are multiples of the cup there's because three. certain... Uh, pretty sure there's three. Certain unnamed people have dropped it <laughs> on the ice. I'm pretty sure there's three, but there's yeah, still there's effectively one. Yeah, there is one idea of the Stanley Cup that gets passed. Remember, it was originally a challenge cup. Yep. I would almost want to bring that back someday. I also agree. But yeah, imagine <laughs> it, you know, football could have done the same thing. They, you know, it's a new relative football's relatively new. When they started football, they could have been like, yeah, only one trophy. This is it. You know, hockey's older. Ho- they could have just be like, hockey's already been doing it. Right? It wasn't a new idea. In Do you the, know what the oldest in continuous the 60s, hockey franchise is in the United States? Oh, in the United States? Yeah. It's the Red Wings, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, Red Wings. Okay, yeah. whatever. Uh, <laughs> all these teams are crazy old. The original six teams, whatever. Yep. Um, I mean, in this video, they're talking about how the, the Rangers are like, oh, man, it was real hard and we had to play the Maroons. <laughs> the Mon- Montreal Maroons. <laughs> all right? So, yeah. So pretty awesome. The meta moment, Connecticut this weekend, Hartford, Connecticut. Holy shit! This is gonna be off the hook. Right. So you know we run panels and workshops at Connecticut. Yes, me, Scott, and we added a third person, Kristen, thus forming the triumvirate. Right. Triad for it. Uh, <laughs> the thing with Connecticut is that it's an everything geek con, which is awesome. Right. To begin with, is that we have done such a good job with these panels. 
right? That I actually want to go to Kineticon and not work at Kineticon. It's a surprise. I didn't, I didn't foresee this for some reason that if I worked at a convention that our influence would improve the convention to such a degree that I would no longer want to work it and would want to attend it. Kineticon is a con that if I suddenly was not staff and was not presenting anymore... And had to pay for a badge with money... I'd probably keep going. I would keep going. Absolutely. So not only are there tons of amazing panels and workshops... Let's see, Japanese handcraft, small press publishing, Beyond Dungeons and Dragons... I wonder who's doing that one. Rock climbing, analyzing animation, atomic robo Q&A... Yeah, we don't need to read the whole thing, but yeah. Adam Warrock concert. Woo! OC Remix doing three panels. Oh my god, OC Remix is going to be there. Right, Super Art Fight is going to be there. Oh, Super Art Fight. All sorts of voice actors and guys with the glasses I know you people like, and Team Four Stars I know you people like, and even though I don't really care about those Jim that much. Jim Cummings, Uncle Yo, all these people are there. Everybody's there. Uh, also, there's going to be a Netrunner tournament. But you know what? This Netrunner tournament, I didn't find out about it till just recently. The official Kineticon Netrunner tournament has a, this is not a joke or an exaggeration, a $1,000 prize payout. If you win the Kineticon Netrunner tournament, you get $500. That's insane. I mean, where the fuck does this money come from? I mean, you win a tournament at like the Strat, and it's like, here you go, have a play mat and a and a token of appreciation. You won, congratulations. Here, you get the next data pack for free, fifteen bucks, five hundred dollars. In second place, three hundred dollars. Third and fourth place, hundred dollars each. Net run a tournament. Oh, and there's also all these other tournaments where that pay out also, like Magic tournaments and a Star Wars LCG tournament and all sorts of craziness. Also, Kineticon has better tabletop gaming than most gaming cons we ever attend. Yep, they're going to have tons of tables for role-playing and or tabletop board war gaming, and the library of board games is the greatest that I have personally seen. It may not be the greatest at any con, it's the greatest I have been to. Even better, dare I say, than the PAX board game library. So... One complaint we do get every year is that we don't do enough panels. So we are only doing six this year. Oh, because we only have, six. We have duties. Just put ourselves on the schedule there. So we're doing, and I'll, y'all link to it, Android Netrunner, Beyond Dungeons and Dragons, anime openers from around the world, the panel auditions for Kineticon 2014, mm. a decade of running panels, some non-18+, plus, opposite the 18-plus content where... Uh, I got some horror stories about running panels like a decade ago at like Ohio Con. Mm. And how to recommend anime. Oh, we did that one already. That was good. Yeah. And uh, Beyond Dungeons and Dragons, for those of you not going to PAX Australia, we're doing the dry practice run of the new version of the panel at Kineticon. And then the next week on Friday, we're doing it at PAX Australia. Uh, at 1 p.m. in the Wombat Theater. Wombat Theater. And then at PAX Prime on Monday, because PAX Prime is now four days long. And PAX Prime is merely like a month after PAX Oz. We are at 1.30 p.m. in the Wolfman Theater. I think we've been scheduled in that theater more times than any other theater. I think Arachnid is number two for us. Mm. Naga might be number three. We've done a lot of goddamn PAX panels. <laughs> So yeah, we are doing a new panel, brand new, called Bad Games. Maybe we should put that panel together in August. I've been working on it, actually. (laughs) I got this whole bit about Yahtzee. Is Yahtzee a good game or a bad game? And the answer depends on how smart you are. (laughs) But not in the way you'd expect. Okay, so speaking of all this con traveling, oh, first, what's the book club book, Rim? The book club book is a book called Stasiland, Nonfiction Narratives about what it's what it was actually like for real people to live under the Stasi in East Germany. All right. It's actually pretty good. I've been reading it. So, yeah, speaking of PAX Oz, so Kineticon this weekend, then we're flying to PAX Oz, then we're doing PAX Oz, and then we're going to be in Melbourne for the rest of July, which means you won't see Geek Nights until August. So what will you do to alleviate your boredom besides listen to crappy old Geek Nights episodes? I don't even know why you listen to this episode. What you should do is you should follow us in all the other internet places, me, Rim, and Geek Nights accounts on, you know, Flickr, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, Google Plus, and we will be posting things from down under. 
all our pictures might get flipped over upside down <laughs> and yeah, when they because, get uploaded yeah, to Flickr. No one, no one's ever made that joke. No one has until just now. In fact, I recall in the forum, Not the on PAX this forum podcast. for PAX Australia and on the Reddit, there was a rule that was basically, if you make the joke, fix that for you and flip a picture upside down, we will kill you. <laughs> uh, but yeah you should follow all those things especially because we might die of poison while we're there that's also very or possi- possibly starvation and be, or dehydration this could be the last geek nights ever oh it's possible ominous ominous <laughs> so if you are at pax australia or if you happen to be a geek nights listener who lives in or about melbourne uh let us know we are Kind of going out there without our usual entourage. It's just us two. Yeah. No bodyguards, no friends, no family. It's just us. So if you want to hang out with us or kidnap us or whatever, it's probably your best chance. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on. So you might recall that uh, we, in numerous lectures, in fact, uh, I'll link to one of them from uh, PAX East, which wasn't that long ago. We talk about how games like Shadows Over Camelot suck ass. Oh, Oh, most specifically Pandemic. And Pandemic, st- to some Shadows similar of extent, the Battlestar Galactica game. Yep, though that game that game's least, a little bit it's a little bit better than the other ones, but yes, that game, especially with the expansion, at least has more of a mafia feel to it. But I digress. We say that these games are crap. And Scott, what is our primary reason for hating on these games? Well, the, the communication rules, specifically in Shadows Over Camelot, are vague and bullshit. Well, I feel pretty good about playing cards in that area. I feel about three goods. <laughs> three three times good. Let I feel go three the, times let better Let me go than to the refrigerator. Before. How many people want water? One, two, three, four. Four people want water, but not Rim. Rim doesn't want water, everybody. Rim did not ask for water from the fridge. Yeah, fuck those games. Yeah. We, we have talked at length about why these are bad mechanics. This is why mm. Bridge has such complicated meta signaling rules. Mm. This is why you're not allowed to fucking talk to your partner in Euchre. Yep. So... Uh, what happened is we looked at the Spiel des Jahres nominees and I saw a bunch of games on there and one of them was called Hanabi and I was like, oh, I never heard of that. So then I'm in like freaking complete strategist, you know, for Netrunner or something. And I see on the, you know, every game store has that shelf towards the front that has the tiny games in a box about the same size box as say, um, what's the game with chicken with the red chips? Uh, Oh, no thanks. No thanks. In the same size box as no thanks, I see... Hanabi. And I'm like, oh, isn't that the Spiel des Jahres nominee? How is it in this tiny ass box for such a little bit of money? I will buy this on Amazon because the strat is overpriced. So I bought it on Amazon. Oh, spoilers. It later did win the Spiel des Jahres. Yeah, like fucking two days ago. <laughs> it won the Spiel des Jahres. But I bought it and played it before it won. Uh, and we brought it home and we played it. It's for two to five players. We played it mostly two player, but we've played it more than that at least once or twice. Yeah, now Scott I've- shows this to me and he's like, it's a co-op game, and it's really straightforward. Well, I, at first, I read the rules, and on reading the rules, I said, I, once I started reading the rules, I was like, oh, shit, it's fucking Pandemic Shadows Over Camelot. And then I kept reading, and I was like, this has a possibility of fixing that problem while still being that game. So and I didn't the deal. know until I actually played it with Rim to confirm the truth. The game gives you explicit detailed rules on what information you can and cannot share. And more importantly, the sharing of the information is a game mechanic. You spend a token to tell someone a piece of information. Yep. Also, it explicitly says in the rules, quote, if you follow the rules closely, you can only communicate with your teammates when you give them information, placing a blue token Period. In other words, there is no ambiguity over what you can and can't say. Can I use codes? Can I say things like this? No, it's like you cannot communicate. That is as firm a statement as I have ever heard. Now, at the same time, it is impossible as humans to not communicate. Because, for example, I'll draw a card and everyone else at the table goes, oh. Mm-hmm. That, that actually is useful information. It is. Or I'll be like, hey, Rim, you have one red card. Now, I'll be thinking. One red card. Well, if Scott says that on my turn, here's my thought process. Scott wouldn't have told me that unless he had a reason to tell me. I'm going to assume that he's smart, and I'm just going to play this card blindly. 
Oh, so let's get back to the game. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Hanabi, right? Which is the Japanese word for fireworks. It's got a fireworks theme. And the idea is that everyone who's playing the game is cooperatively trying to set off a fireworks display. And to set off a fireworks display, there are five colors of cards numbered one through five. And you want to play the one, then the two, then the three, then the four, then the five of each color. And you're working on all the fireworks at the same time. So at the beginning of the game, playing any one is good. You know, once you've got some ones down, playing a two is good as long as the one of that color is already down and so on. When you play a five, that firework goes off and you're all set. But here's the catch. Everyone draws cards. And on your turn, you can either A, play one, B, discard one, or C, give someone information. Well, why am I giving people information? Because you can never look at your own cards. Do you know how many times when we first started playing this, I would draw a card and just instinctively look at it? Yeah, you can never, ever, ever, under any circumstance, no rule whatsoever allows you to look at your own cards. You I see hold on your Board cards. Game Geek, some guys made a clever, they made stands to face the cards outward at everyone else. Yep. I like to hold them in my hand so I can arrange them. Oh, in I different have this ways. complicated three dimensional lattice where I'll hold the cards to remember what yeah, information I put cards I know. in between different fingers to remember what they are after people tell me about them. Because even after they tell me about them, he said, Someone tells me, Okay, Scott, you have two reds. I got to remember I have two reds and that those are the two reds. And that before, one of those was a three. Yeah. So this one's a red three and this one's a red question mark number. Okay. Yeah. And so I got to keep shuffling these cards around in my hand. And then if I spend a whole bunch of turns giving other people information, I got it. If I forget what I've got in my hand, oh shit, we're fucked. Now, you, there's these tokens, and basically you have to spend a token to give someone information and about whatever's in their hands. And there are only eight clock tokens at the beginning of the game. And to give a piece of information, all you can say is how many of a card you point at of a number or color do they have? So I could say, these three cards are red, or this card is a one. You must give complete information. If so I if someone has three ones, you can't be like, you got two ones, or you got one one. No, it's you got three ones if they have three ones. And you can't say anything about a card you can't point at. So I cannot say, Scott, you have no ones. Yep, because that would not include pointing. You have to point at cards. Right? You could so you can be like you have one green, you have two red, and you only get to give one fact each clock you spend. Yeah, color or number. Color or number. One fact. So I be so spend the clock, tell Remy has two reds, point at the two cards that are the red ones. It's up to him to remember that those two are red, and now it's not my turn anymore. That's it. That's a whole turn. You get into this great cycle where Scott gives me a piece of information, I play a card. Scott gives me a piece of information, I play a card. There's no more tokens, and Scott doesn't know shit about his hand. Yeah. Great. What you have to do is basically you have to remember that card you have to oh, play. Oh, Give me an information, then I play one, then you play one. Two other confounding factors. There's three ones... Two of every other number and only one five. So if you discard a five... You're fucked. You can't get a top score. You, you can't get the maximum score. But at the same time, if you discard two of anything else, you can't get the top score. Like if you discard two green fours, well, green can't get three I guess if you discard now. all three ones of something, Unlikely. You're too. I've never had a game where all the ones didn't get played. I can't imagine that happening. You have to be so dumb for that to happen. Uh, but yeah, we've never gotten a 25. The most we got is 22. And yep. usually but we get 19 or 20. The first time we played, we got a 20. And uh, that's why this game is great. Now, you can get a score of zero because if you play a card that doesn't work... For example, I play a red three, and the red two is not there and open. That's a, that's a wrong play. The three goes in the garbage, and we lose a fuse. And once you lose the third fuse, game over, you get a score of zero. So the way we played this game, and it's telling, I really want to watch people who don't listen to this show that we're doing right now and who aren't kind of, I don't know, into analyzing games like we are because... It's interesting to see how they would approach a game like this because we approached it so methodically without any preparation or forethought that I was kind of amazed. Like Scott and I and our friend Alex, when we sat down to play, it was just assumed if someone told someone about one card, they should play it. If someone told them about two cards, they would keep that information aside. And all these sort of obvious strategies just emerged immediately and automatically. Yeah, there's all these sort of implications, right? The other thing you have to do is you have to pay attention to the discard pile and also the cards that are face up and the cards in other people's hands, right? If someone tells me I have two reds, I look at the table and I see, okay, these can't be ones because I see all three red ones. Rim's holding one, there's one on the table, and there's one in the discard. So it's not. these are not ones. Are they twos? 
Well, there's only one two on the table in the discard pile. So if, I don't want to discard either one of these because yep. if it's the other two, we're fucked. But you don't know which one of them is I don't a two. know which one it is. Uh, it, could it be a three? Yes, it could be a three. Could it be a five? No, because Alex is holding the red five. So these are twos, threes, or fours. I don't know which ones so, they are. But, so that means you know, rather than playing or discarding either one of them, you'll discard some other card. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to say if this is cheating, but I rapidly fell upon a strategy that I follow without fail no matter what when I play this game, which is the newest card that I have drawn, unless someone gives me information about it, is the first one I will discard if I have to discard a card. Mm -hmm. Because I assume my smart friends would tell me if the card were important. There's another thing that I do, right, is I keep track of which card is the card I just drew. So if, let's say, for example, I have in my hand, like, a red two, right? And we've already played a red two, so no one's really going to waste a clock to tell me about it, right? Just so I'll discard it to get a clock back. That's sort of a, a wasted action. It's not very efficient, right? Let's say I draw a red three, which we haven't played yet. Somebody's going to want to tell me that I have one point at that card so that I play it. But let's say I have another three in my hand. What are they going to do? Tell me that I have two threes? I don't know which one now. Are they going to tell me I have two red cards? Well, if they tell me I have two red cards, and I know that one of them is the one I just played, and one of them is one that's been sitting in my hand the whole game, now I can imply that one that I recently drew must be interesting for them to suddenly tell me I had two red cards, right? When I already knew about this other one. Now, it was funny because we played this game with another friend of ours who hasn't played as many of these kinds of games with us. Equally smart, just hasn't played in our gaming culture. And she took the opposite meaning. We pointed out information about one card, and she assumed we were telling her to get rid of that shit. <laughs> and immediately corrected that and played the rest of the game identically to the way we were playing. Yeah. So it's funny. You can, you'll be able to watch groups of friends converge on strategies in an unspoken yeah. manner. Yeah. But it's like, nobody's using, you know, the thing you worry about, like secret winking codes to like, just so that they know what's in their hand. Exactly. You're cheating like that. Right. I make you're not allowed to communicate. I make but a really good effort to poker face it. Like if I, I mean, I'll say something like, uh Yeah, you are not allowed to communicate. That's cheating. And it's co-ops. You're only cheating yourself if you cheat, right? You're yep. not, it's, there's no traitor like in Shadows Over Camelot. It's like, you're just cheating yourself. But if it goes around the table and nobody's happy for all their turns and no one's really playing anything, then you can assume that all the cards in your hand are bullshit in some manner. You also need to tell people right away if they have fives so they keep them safe. That's your only Keep real, it secret. Your Keep only it chance safe. of getting a really high score is to actually play some of the fives, because when you play a five, you get a clock back, and you only other way to get a clock back is to discard a card. And discarding a card, while it gets you a clock back and clears out your hand and allows you to draw into new cards that you need to play, also hastens the end of the game without scoring you any points. So two points. You need to increase... To, to win this game, you need to increase the number of actions you spend playing cards and decrease the number of actions you spend giving information and discarding. So I have two po big points to make about this game. Point number one, a perfect score basically will come down to luck in the same way that, coincidentally enough, the most recent uh, book club book before this one, Player of Games, Getting a Full Web... Everyone knew how to do it. It just needed the right circumstances. Exactly. You need the right circumstances to get a perfect you score. You need to get a draw. A lot of games I've played, like I played a game with the Netrunner people, right, who are also equally smart at gaming. They all knew what was going on right away. And someone just drew like four or fives at the get-go. And it's like, all right, that really bones us. Right, yep. but you have four or fives. Don't discard those. Be useless for most of the rest of the game. It's possible with that. With like, you play with a bunch of people. Everyone can draw like one, two, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, all different colors, and you can spend like the whole beginning of the game easily just playing them all really rapidly without any issues whatsoever. Hell, I feel like we we almost thought about doing this. We can make a YouTube video where we show like strategy and Hanabi, but it would be awesome to some friends with a choreographed play where we've memorized the deck and basically just play it out, like make up logic, like sit there and be like, well, because you said this and you said this and you said this, I can infer therefore this and just play a perfect game without even thinking. Mm -hmm. But that would have been more effort than mm. just playing the game until we eventually luck out and max it out. Point number two is that if you play this game a lot with your friends and you're getting scores about 20 and up regularly, 
you've basically solved the game, I think, at that point. I want to keep playing until I get a 25. I do as well. But, but yeah, I don't think it's actually possible to get 25 regularly. You need to have that good draw, right? And it's you're not going to get that good draw all the time. It's just not going to happen. Now, it is still possible in those situations, but the best part about this game is that situation where you're looking at someone's cards, or everyone's cards, and you know any piece of information you give them just because of the luck of what is in their hands will cause them to do a thing you don't want them to do because they will infer the wrong thing. Mm. That is the worst feeling See, in the world. that's why. That's exactly why. You might think that all this inferred information, right, this sort of wink-wink, nudge-nudge, is communication that is outside the bounds of the rules. But no, it's perfectly okay, and it's the point of the game, is because that nudge-nudge, wink-wink, is going to bite you as much as it's going to help you. You're going to find yourself thinking at many points... Is Scott as smart as I have always assumed him to be? Mm -hmm. And then you say a piece of information and just hope right. against hope. If I tell Rim he has one green, what is the context of that? What information does Rim have? You know, what decision will he make? I can't make him. All I can do is tell him he has one green and point at it. I can maybe say it with emphasis. Like you have one green card, Rim. One. One green card. And I can make all <laughs> kinds of faces. But I can't say discard it. I can't say play it. I can't, you know, we could, and not, we're, if we come with a signal system, again, we're cheating ourselves, right? So what is he going to make of that? You know, and if, you know if what, we Scott, had a system before where that meant play it and I want him to discard it, now what? Yep. <laughs> now what? It's sort of the quantum information problem of if you prearrange your quantum states to use for communication, you've basically undermined the whole idea of quantum communication. So, side note about this game. It is made and designed by Antoine Bauza. Do you know who Antoine Bauza is? Why, Antoine Bauza, I was trying to look him up on Board Game E, is a user. That he, didn't help me. He is a user, but if you scroll down, you'll see the games he made. Oh, which Seven include, Wonders. He is the Seven Wonders guy. Smart guy. Seven Wonders guy. So, look forward to anything from Antoine Bauza. If he made Seven Wonders in Hanabi and has a spiel this year, uh... Guy is going places in the game design world. Absolutely. This game, if I had to describe the brain field, also... is incredibly stressful to play. Mm. You are putting your full attention. If you fuck up and start thinking about biscuits, you're going to forget which one of those two cards you put to the side is a four. And then you're fucked. And Scott and I have both done that. The whole At one point, Scott had a white four, the last one, a green four, and a red four in his hand. And he, he should have known that which one was the white four from previous information, but I think he mixed them up because he's flipping around. He's like, I know I can discard one of these fours, and he's holding them in his hands, and then he's holding the white one. He's like, so I can't discard the white one, and I know this isn't the white one. And I, the whole time, I'm just trying not to make a face. I'm just like, please don't fuck up. Please don't fuck up. Please don't fuck up. We got really lucky that time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, I can't communicate with anyone about what's in their hand, but I can say about what's in my hand, right? That doesn't help anyone, right? So it's like just during my turn, I'll be like, all right, I'm be saying what I'm thinking and moving cards around. No one can help me. I'm all on my own, Yep. right? But I think that adds a lot of fun in, the, in giving the other people the experience you just said of, you know, being tortured by me being wrong or well, like I fucked up also in one being game. amazed by me being right. Like, I oh. fucked up big and I'm in one game. Game, I put a five to the side in my hand way early in the game. And at one point, I must have just moved it. And then later, I was like, all right, play in the five. And I throw it down. It's like a two that we needed. And the game was fucked. And I just had no idea. I just, I, I envisioned it as a five. I threw it down and I saw for a split second a five until my brain was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That doesn't match. Uh, the eyes are giving us reports that perhaps you have fucked up. <laughs> Waiting for confirmation. Yes, Rim, you have fucked up. Well, the other reason that I say what I'm thinking on my turn out loud when it's a complicated turn is to demonstrate and educate the other players as to how I think they should think about their hands, right? Like if I say, oh, I'm discarding this because I see what's on the table and now I'm showing other people, look, look at the table and make decisions the same way I'm making them. I'm not giving you specific information about your hand as it currently is in cheating, I'm giving you basically generic game tips how to decide with the information that you have legally what to do, the same way that I'm deciding what to do. The game 
is an excellent teaching tool. You don't win a Spiel des Jahres when you suck. So far, I've never seen a sucky Spiel des Jahres game. But Look, this game Some is, years are better than others, but still. This is the kind of game that if I was teaching, like, game design or gameplay at, like, a college, I would make the class play this game, and I would make them write papers on it and play it and practice it and try to get good at it. Yep. Because it illustrates card counting. It illustrates... What information is and is not conveyed by certain pieces of information? It teaches you kind of from the other side how to solve simple games. It's also, you know, there are a lot of people I've met in the gaming world. It's hard to get them to play games because they sort of have anti-competitive bones in their body. And it's hard to get them to play tabletop games because that are, you know, good because they're usually competitive and the co-op games are not good. And this is finally sort of a, you know, a cooperative game that engages uh, a lot of those brain muscles that are used in a serious competitive game like, say, a Puerto Rico. So it's a way to bring those people into the tabletop fold. You know, I think, it, you know, Settlers is a gateway game for the people to move from like a regular board game to a Euro game who are kind of competitive. I think this is actually sort of my new go-to gateway game uh, to bring in those people who are like averse to competition. Though Spotted serves that purpose well because losing doesn't feel like losing. Well, yeah, so are the Cards Against Humanities. And actually, King of Tokyo sort of is not too bad. Yeah. Um, but King of Tokyo, well, King I, don't of Tokyo like it as a, I don't like it as much as an intro game because of it had all the stack of cards with all the random powers. Well, King not... of Tokyo also uh, has a problem we didn't anticipate. We talked about this on the show that Almost everyone younger than us that we know has never played Yahtzee in their lives. Yeah. Which I'm just amazed by. You got a Yahtzee thing going on lately. I know. So I have a closing question for all you kids out there in case you don't see our panel at Pax Oz and we die and the footage is lost. Does it matter if you take turns playing Yahtzee like the book says or if you just play it all solitaire at the table like turn by turn and then at the end, count up your scores. Is there any reason you should play completely ooh, ooh, ooh. I singularly? Know. I know. Pick me. Pick of course me. you know, I, I, ass. <laughs> I know. Pick me. All I right, guys. Hopefully we'll see at least one or two of you in Australia. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're someone who likes games, you should own Hanabi. Just buy it and keep it in your repertoire. This is such, it's a tiny little game. It's, it's probably the most game in the least box, right? Any other game in this size box, I mean, this is better than no thanks, right? Bonanza would be, except it comes, a bigger in too, box. it comes in too big of a box. Bonanza's in a bigger box. I think this is the most game and the least box I've ever seen. I mean, oh, there's expansions within, too. You can add these colored fireworks. Oh, just, we haven't even gone into that shit yet. Oh, my yet. God. Because Not, when we get a 25, then we'll go for that. Yeah, basically, you, the game gives the you game two ways. The game includes hard mode. Uh, it includes four hard modes. Fuck all four of them. <laughs> right in the ass. <laughs> They're good. Yeah, but, it, you know, hey, for a game that it's sort of like, oh, I get 25 and I never play it again. It's like, no, get 25, then do bitch mode. <laughs> <laughs>has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>